Again, I want to welcome everyone here this evening and appreciate those, uh, each of you for being here. I want to remind everyone that uh, the elders are placing before the congregation for consideration of being deacons Brother Henry Bourne, Brother Elwood Brantley, and Brother Bill Bush. If you have a scriptural objection, please see the elders. And barring any scriptural objection, then these three men will be appointed as deacons of the congregation next Sunday. So, I do want to remind everyone of that. Uh, also, I wanted to mention this this morning, and it simply slipped my mind. I, unless I write something down, I usually forget and I didn't write it down, but I wanted to express appreciation for Henry Bourne. He continues to come up here and work on the building, and he has done some work in the ladies' bathroom, so I know you ladies will be appreciative of that. Uh, and uh, it is appreciated for that work that he comes up and does. In First Peter, the fifth chapter, we read this morning, verses 6 through verse 11, for Peter writes, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. Whom resist, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. But the God of all grace who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while. Uh, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Satan is an adversary that is very strong, very cunning, crafty, he knows what he is doing. He's very effective in that which he aims to accomplish. And that which he is intending is always in opposition to the cause of Christ and that which is right. Indifference is one of Satan's most successful ways. As we mentioned this morning, that Indifference, <laughs> indifference is having no concern or feeling, no interest, showing no preference as defined by Webster in his dictionary. Certainly indifference in the religious realm is a problem. We see it more and more within the church. We, this morning, discuss materialism, how materialism has affected the church, and especially in the United States, and as a result, indifference has come about because of that materialism. But we also noted the inconsistency of those who claim to be Christians causes indifference. And one area that I did not mention this morning was the, in regards to that inconsistency is the, the problem of division within the church. We all know that Christ prayed for unity. John 17, verses 20 and 21, when he says, Neither pray I for these alone, that would be the apostles alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their work that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou didst send me. Jesus prayed for our unity. And yet, we see division. We see division in the religious world, and uh, some people have ignorantly thanked God for the division that we see in the religious world in spite of the fact that he prayed for unity. We see division that took place in the church at Corinth. 
1 Corinthians, the first chapter. And he starts by telling them the cure for that in verse 10 when he says, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For if it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Now this I say, every one of you saith, I, have, I am of Paul, and I of Apollos, and I of Cephas, and I of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you, or were you baptized in the name of Paul? He set forth for them that, yes, here's what's taking place in the church, that is religious division, and it's wrong. There is to be no division. Well, obviously, as we look at the religious world as a whole, there's, and I don't know the current figure, I know the figure that you know I grew up with was 365 different religious groups all claiming to be of Christ. And that's still sometimes used by preachers, and it's so out of date that it's uh, ridiculous. Uh, multiply that by at least five, and you're starting to come close to it. It's well over a thousand and, pro and getting closer to two thousand different religious groups all claiming to be of Christ now. And Christ prayed for unity. And it causes people who look at that type of a situation to say, <laughs> you know, which one is right? Who cares anymore? And, of course, the religious world goes right along with it, saying, oh, it doesn't really matter what you believe, as long as you're sincere, and I guess you do need to believe that in Christ. But some of them are even getting away from that. What if the religious world is so divided it causes indifference among those individuals who look at the situation? And you would almost ask, why shouldn't it? But forgetting the denominational world for a minute, and you look just at the church of our Lord, you see again divisions that have been taking place throughout the years. You can go back, you know, back in the late 1800s. And at that time, you had the division that took place because of missionary society and mechanical instruments and music that was finally recognized by the U.S. Census in 1906 and seeing two different groups religious division. But then you look at the church of our Lord and it seemed as if there was unity for a while, but again, division came up within the Lord's church. And you had the problems of anteism in which some were trying to bind things that God had not bound. Religious or division within the church. Now then you have going the opposite way, the liberalism that is seen in which they loose things that God is bound. And the figure that is bannered around, and I don't know if it's accurate or not, but would not surprise me, but many times the figure is given that there are 23 separate divisions within the churches of Christ. And Christ prayed for unity. It causes indifference and it causes people to leave Christianity because they see all of the divisions within the church. The cure, of course, for that is to recognize the authority of the scriptures and to do things that God has authorized and only do those things that God has authorized. 
And when we do that, it will cure the religious division. Or going back to the language there of Paul in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 10, that we speak the same things, that we be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. That produces unity. But then another cause of indifference is when people judge Christianity by the perversions of Christianity. Christianity is a way of life taught and exemplified by Christ. In Acts, the first chapter, as, Paul, or as Luke is writing this second letter, he begins by saying, The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach. Now, Theophilus, here is Jesus, and that former treatise, which was the gospel account of Luke, he says, that concerned what Jesus did and what he taught. Christianity is both of those. It is what one teaches and what one does. And what Jesus taught is what he lived. His life was consistent with his teachings. That wasn't true in relationship to a lot of people during the first century. For example, Matthew 23rd chapter is uh, Jesus is confronting and the uh, Pharisees and the scribes, and he says, starting in verse 1 of Matthew 23, Then spake Jesus unto the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. But do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. Jesus said and did. Not so with the Pharisees and scribes. They said, but they did not. Christianity involves both of them. We are to teach correctly, but we are also to act in accordance with that teaching. A lot of people, though, do not act in accordance with what is taught. And so people outside start looking at that type of a situation, look at that individual, and they say, well, look at that person. He's not doing what he says. Now, we generally refer to that person as a hypocrite. And how many times have you heard people in the world accusing the church and saying, well, I don't want to go there and be with all of those hypocrites? Well, you can be in eternity with them, but uh, that's another matter. That's where they will be along with all of the hypocrites. But they see the hypocrisy of uh, many of the members of the church, and it causes indifference on their part. Then there are those individuals who start looking at Christianity and they make accusations against Christianity when in reality they don't even know anything about it. How many times have you heard someone parroting what some supposed expert said by saying, why the Bible is filled with mistakes and contradictions. Oh, it is? Name one. Oh, uh, me, that's a different matter now. Because they don't know. All that they've been doing is following what somebody else told them. Why well, the Bible's filled with mistakes. The Bible's filled with contradiction. Okay, the Bible's filled with mistakes and contradictions. I believe that now. And so they hear this supposed expert over here saying it, 
and they thus accept a perversion of what that individual has stated. They've never really investigated themselves. And then there are those perversions of Christianity in which someone will look at denominationalism, they'll look at error that and give it the claim of Christianity because it was simply done in the name of Christianity. How many times does someone bring up, oh, look at what, and they're talking about what the Roman Catholic Church did years ago and the atrocities that they involved themselves in against mankind. They did. That's a fact of the matter. But the Roman Catholic Church is a perversion of Christianity. It's not true Christianity. But they have judged Christianity by that perversion of it, not by the truth of it. And that's the problem. But as a result of that, judging Christianity by the perversion of it, they, have, they don't want anything to do with it. They become indifferent toward religion because of the failure of some individuals in doing that which is wrong. Then there's many times the claim that, well, Christians aren't really concerned with this life. All they're interested in is, as it was stated by some years ago, getting the pie in the sky in the by and by. All, in other words, all they're interested in has nothing to do with this world. It's only heaven. And so this world is just nothing to them. It's, they have no concern about it. They don't have any concern about others. All they're interested in is getting to heaven themselves. Again, they haven't really studied the scriptures. They don't know what it's about. Look at Jesus, for example. In John the 6th chapter, how he fed the multitude of people. Why? Because they were hungry. Look at what uh, Peter said concerning Jesus in Acts the 10th chapter in verse 38, that he went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. And why did he do that if he wasn't concerned with people? And yet the accusation, not concerned about it. In James the first chapter, James says that pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows and to keep himself unspotted in, in, from the world. That's in James 1.27. The word visit there doesn't, we've emphasized this before, does not mean just going by and saying hi to them. It means meeting their needs. It is meeting the needs of those who are fatherless and widows. but we're supposedly not interested in those individuals. There's many, many hospitals in our world today that have been started directly as a result of religious groups. But can you name any that have been started by the atheist? Do you find a, here's this hospital, and it's the atheist hospital. It was set forth and set up by atheists. It's run by atheists because they hate God. You don't see that, but how many as a direct result of religion? And yet the charge is, and I say that simply to point out the charge is in the opposite in reality. Those who are atheists care nothing about the people of this world. It's only those who are religious who care about the people of the world. In James 2 and verse 14, he says, What doth it profit, my brethren, if a man say he hath faith and have not works, can that faith save him? Now what was that predicated upon? 
well, here's a man who has, who has a need, and what is it? You go out and say to that man, why be warmed and filled? What good is it? What profit is it? If you say you have faith, but you don't have works. And the works there, within that context, deals with meeting the need of that individual who is in need. He has need, food, raiment, and all you're doing is saying, be warmed and filled. Go on your way now. We've said to be warmed and filled. Go on your way. We won't, don't care about you. No, you care about them. You take care of the need. That's Christianity. That's doing good to all men. And that's what God expects of Christians. But then there is also the accusation that is, again, causes religious indifference that Christianity is just the opiate of the masses, it is the dependency, it's going back to, and some of them relate it going back to childhood days, where you have a dependency on the parents. You All you are are dependent upon this so-called God in the sky. But is that the case in reality? Or is Christianity something that is far different than that, in which it takes, instead of dependency, it takes strength. Listen to what Paul writes in Ephesians 6, chapter, starting in verse 10, when he says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. Now wait, that doesn't sound like dependency. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, and above all, taking the shield of faith wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Christianity, instead of being a religion for weaklings, as it is sometimes portrayed, is a religion that demands strength. Intestinal fortitude, or as we sometimes refer to simply as guts. Christianity demands that an individual be strong, not a weakling. And it does take it takes strength of character in order to live the Christian life, in order to withstand the temptations that Satan places upon us and upon many times our friends and neighbors and the ostracism, the ridicule that comes along. It doesn't take... Well, a weak person is not going to endure it. The weak person will turn back into the ways of the world. It takes strength to be a Christian and to remain a Christian. God's demands are high and stringent. He places great demands upon us. Look at what Jesus said, Matthew the 16th chapter. He says unto his disciples, starting in verse 24, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever shall save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profited if he should gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Take up your cross. That's not for a weakling. That's not for some baby over here. It's for someone who's strong and has courage, Courage enough to take that stand for God, to follow Him, 
and not follow after the ways of the world. Not follow the crowd. People need to sincerely investigate God's Word and what it actually says and what it actually teaches. Instead of many times listening to the perversions that are set forth about God's Word and about Christianity, they need to sincerely investigate because God demands strength of character. He demands us to live the way in which He sets forth and not simply give in to anything and everything that comes along. But then also, another cause of indifference would be the prevalence of immorality. In Matthew, the 24th chapter, and verse 12, and hopefully all of you in going through our Sunday morning Bible class here in the auditorium will know immediately that the context of this is the destruction of Jerusalem. However, within that context, he sets forth a general principle that was true in relationship to the situation there with the destruction of Jerusalem, but the general principle is true in regards to any time. That because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. In other words, here's sin and iniquity, immorality, ungodliness, all around. And because of that, what happens? People become indifferent concerning religion, concerning religious matters. We today, in our society, live in a sick society. I, I don't think anyone can argue the fact. We live in a sick society. When we look at the crime, the dishonesty, the alcoholism, the millions of babies that are born out of wedlock to even young teenage children, children having children, and they continue to have these children. Why? Because, one reason, because our government supplements their income. Why? Because they've had another child. And they teach them thus, go and have another one so you can get some more money. That's what our government does. And thus you have these children, having children, and then those that are not wanted, well, we'll just kill them off, and so we have about a million and a half abortions taking place every year. That's within the United States. Worldwide, supposedly, about 5 million abortions take place every year. Or actually, 55 million abortions take place every year. Worldwide. We live in a sick society. Now then, we're not only seeing the abortion in relationship to one who's in the womb. We have partial birth abortion that takes place now. And if that's not good enough, we have the infanticide that's now taking place. Baby's born, something's wrong with it, just let him die. And some places, are ad in fact, it has been advocated that a baby that is born is not classified to be human until he's two years old. Now, what does that mean? That means up until the time he's two years old, he's not a human, and so you can do away with it. Because it's an id, it's not a human. That's what some have argued in our society today. But then we also go to the other aspect, and that's euthanasia. The word euthanasia means mercy kill, or good death, actually, is what it means. A good death. What is it? You just let a person die, or you go ahead and kill a person. And so we had Dr. Kevorkian, Dr. Death, going around and teaching people how to kill themselves. And others are advocating, yes, go ahead and... Put them to death. We live in a sick society today. We need to realize that the Bible teaches the value of the individual. 
each and every individual. Christianity places a value upon the soul of each individual. And that we are to be a, the shining light in a world of darkness. We are salt of the earth. Jesus stated in Matthew the 5th chapter, that ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt is lost its Savior, wherewith shall it be salt? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and be trodden under foot of men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light to all that are in the house. And I said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Christianity says this individual, from the time that he is conceived, is valuable. God knows him as an individual. God has forms him in the womb, as Jeremiah talked about in Jeremiah the first chapter, in relationship to his own life. while being formed in the womb. Thou knowest, thou knowest me, he says. Why? Because God recognizes the value of the individual from the moment of conception. And God expects us to respect human life. Why? Because we go back to the very beginning. And we see here is God, and he determines with himself the Godhead that he's going to create man. And he breathes into man's nostrils the breath of life, and man becomes a living soul, but he says that that living soul, that he is made after the image of God. And so here is a human soul that begins at the moment of creation, who's made in the very image of God, that soul is to be respected by man. When we learn to respect man, as God teaches, Christianity teaches, then the idea of abortion, the ideas of euthanasia and infanticide, those things immediately are dis dismissed. They won't take place anymore. Why? Because there's a respect for human life. What about murder? Well, you're not going to murder someone. We're not talking about, and understand, there's a difference between murder and killing. Murder is the intentional taking of human life. That is an unjust taking of human life. Killing, not all killing, is murder. There is the just taking of people's life. Some people forfeit their life to their right to live by the actions that they perform. In fact, God said so. And he talks about it in Genesis the ninth chapter in relationship to murder, that that man who sheds blood, his blood shall be shed. You execute someone who commits murder. Why? Because there is to be a respect for life. And that individual has forfeited his right to life because he did not respect human life. And so you teach respect for human life by executing him and showing that action is not acceptable. Sadly, our society in the United States of America has made that action acceptable today because we basically do nothing about it. something I saw just today. And uh, probably you remember the rape case that took place in Steubenville, Ohio. And the young girl, 16-year-old girl that uh, got drunk, she was to blame for getting drunk, but she was raped that night as well. The young men who raped her well, some of them might have gone to jail for a little while. But the individual who exposed it 
that individual might be going to jail for a long, over twice as long as what the individuals who raped the young girl went to jail for. And we say we respect human life hogwash. We don't. It is, a sh it is a shame that what we see in our society today, why? Because we do not respect human life. If, a, if those young men had respected human life, they would not have raped the young woman. Rape would be out of the picture. Why? Because there was a respect for human life. Stealing. You wouldn't steal from someone because you respect that individual. All of the wickedness and the sin that we see comes as a result. You don't respect human life. You don't respect this individual as being created in the very image of God. When we start getting back to those principles, then the crime and the evil, the wickedness we see in our society will be taken away. But until we do that, until we start, and that's what the church is to be doing, going out and teaching people the respect for human life. If this individual is created in the image of God, he's important. He's important to God. In fact, the Father sent his only begotten Son to die for that individual. How can I disrespect that individual? How can anyone else? We need to get back to teaching those principles and being that shining light in a world of darkness so they can see that which is right and good and honorable. And they then can come to God and obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, God, He looked upon this world and he was not indifferent to the world and to man's needs. In Romans 6, the 5th chapter, starting in verse 6, he says, For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man would one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare die. But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. <coughs> God looked down at man, his creation, and he recognized the importance of him. And he says, I'm going to show my love. I'm going to commend my love to man in allowing my only begotten son to die upon the cross for them. Why? Because man is important. Each soul is important. And we as Christians need then to lovingly respond in obedience to that love that God has demonstrated toward us, as we would see in 1 John 5 and verse 3. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. And we then must continue to work, continue to do what God wants us to do, continue to be that light in a world of darkness, realizing, therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord, 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 58. And when we get out and we start teaching people those principles, we can eliminate much of the evil in, in this world. But as long as we are indifferent and we don't see that love of God and the value of our soul and the value of those souls all around us, each and every one. And we're not going to do anything. And that will be a tragedy, both for that individual that we could influence, but also for our own souls. And so we lovingly care for the souls that are around us, in spite of their wickedness, <clears throat> in spite of their evil, we recognize their value. 
and we do that which is needed for them to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. But we cannot be indifferent regarding these matters. If you've never obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, that's what your need is. To respond to that loving care that God gave in giving His Son to die upon the cross. <clears throat> and in obedience to His will, obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. Become a Christian. If you have not lived the Christian life, if, you've been if you have become indifferent to man and to Christianity, then once again, come back unto Him and then respond in obedience to that love that God has demonstrated toward us. If you need to repent of sins that you've committed within your life, then why not do that this evening as we stand and sing the invitation song? <clears throat>